Well, good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm Melissa, one of the leaders here at Severn, and we are so happy that you chose to join us this morning, whether you're here in person or you're watching us online. We would love to connect with you if this is your first time. You can do that via our online connect card. The link is going to be in the comments. Or you can visit one of our lovely host team folks. Or you can text connect to the number on your screen. Yeah, and uh, speaking of ways to connect, uh, my name is David. I'm the small groups director here at Severn. And I just want to kind of put on your radar uh, some things that are coming up in February uh, that will be opportunities for you to really connect uh, beyond just the Sunday morning gathering or, or watching online. So I'm not going to go into dates or all the details of how to sign up today, but I just want to put it on your radar. Because uh, right now, if you've been maybe tuning in online for a while or you've been showing up for a while, but you still feel like you don't really know anybody, um, there's some things coming up in February, like our Next Steps class, where you can find out who we are as a church and how to be a part of it. Um, you can also meet some people there. Um, also, our spring small group semester starts in February as well. Uh, that's a chance to really get to know a smaller group of people here at the church and really have community. Um, and then also, as always, we're always looking for serve opportunities, and we'll keep you guys posted on ways that you can serve alongside other people here in the church. So it's really just a lot of different opportunities coming up for you. We'll have more details as we get closer to them. Uh, but we just we know church is so much more than just a Sunday morning gathering, and we'd love for, for each and every one of you to really be a part of the community here. Uh, so those are some opportunities coming your way that uh, we definitely think you should take advantage of, and we'd love, for to, love to see you at all of those. So uh, that's all we have for you guys, but uh, let's go ahead and worship. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. Let's start this year off right. Let's stand and let's just worship our God this morning for everything he's done for us.
will sing great. Oh. pray for us on the front end here. Father, uh, I just feel compelled to thank you so much for what you've brought us through. Every, every single one of us listening to this right now, God, you brought us through uh, a whole lot of things in 2020, and you've done that for a reason. You've done that because you love us. You've done that because you have a, a purpose and a calling and a plan for each and every single one of our lives, God. And here we stand on the front end of a new year when we're thinking about resolutions and we're thinking about change and we're thinking about life. And uh, God, I just pray on the front end of this year that we would, maybe for the first time or maybe in a deeper way than ever before, that we would be transformed by grace through faith in your son, Jesus. That we would be transformed for your glory and for our joy. There's nothing greater than that. It's the purpose for which we were made, and I am absolutely convinced that there is nothing in this life that'll satisfy us uh, like that, like transformation by grace through faith in the name of your son, Jesus. That's what we're after, and that's what you provide. That's what you are faithful to provide. In the name of the risen son of God, we ask these things. God's people said, amen. Welcome to Severn and welcome to 2021. My, um, my daughter's birthday is on New Year's Eve. She just turned five on Thursday. So we had her party last night. And she had four friends over for a sleepover last night. And um, there's a line at the end of the book of Judges. It says, there was no king in the land, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In all my life, I've read that verse, and I've thought, what must that have been like? And now I know. I know everything. I know so much. So welcome to 2021. Uh, to start this year, we're going to spend a few weeks in, in a book uh, you probably know at least something about, regardless of your church background, uh, the book of Jonah. Jonah, more so than, than I, I think it's appropriate to say, more so than any other book in the Old Testament, it has a bit of a unique reputation. And now I don't mean that in a good way. I think a lot of people have a tendency, even if they'd never say it out loud, to view Jonah as, as really more of a children's story that has little, if any, relevancy to our lives today. Uh, and just to give you an example, not long ago, I, somebody was, was um, talking to me and they were being very, you know, kind to me. And they said, you know, I, they appreciated my preaching. And, you know, they tell you all the stuff that you want to hear as a pastor. And 
Uh, and they were, they were talking about what they like about my preaching, and they actually compared that, and they said, because, you know, I'm not trying to go to church just to hear about Jonah. And that's basically what inspired this series. No, but um, that's the mindset that I think a lot of people have with Jonah, that it's just, you know, it's kind of incredulous. There's a, a big fish. Maybe that was a whale. Do you take that literally, and what does that mean today? I just want to make you two promises on the front end of this book. We're going to be in it for seven weeks, and I'll tell you two things. Number one... The book of Jonah uh, is going to deal week after week with topics that are as relevant as anything to your life that that all of us are trying to think through right now. I'm talking about just to give you, to get get as explicit as possible. Jonah is going to deal with things like uh, racial prejudice, uh, toxic nationalism, pharisaical religiosity. It's going to talk about the importance of self-awareness, of being able to know what's really going on inside of you and, and the danger and the destruction that's just around the corner for you if you don't get a good read on yourself. It's going to talk about how easy it is to put something in the place of God in your life, how dangerous that is. It's going to talk about the importance of understanding the love of God and how that is so key in the transformation that we're all looking for. Those are all things that, I, regardless of your belief system, we're all after those things because nobody wants to drive off of a cliff in life and wake up one day and realize you don't even recognize who you are and you've done things you swore you'd never do. So first off, the book of Jonah is going to deal with, with, with topics that are extremely relevant, but also you are going to find, this isn't even what I think, you're just going to find the person of Jonah far more relatable than maybe you ever thought possible. And I'll say that regardless of where you're coming from in your faith journey or whatever term you want to use there. Been in church for years, kind of new to this thing and giving it a shot because it's the new year, wherever you're coming from. I I say that because, uh, first off, if you're listening to this, maybe you have made overt attempts in your life to run from God. Uh, You know, no bones about it because, you know, you were burned by the church or God didn't answer a prayer or something happened. There's a great deal of pain in your life. You lost somebody that you loved. Maybe some of us, if we got honest, we're running from God right now to some degree. If that's you, then of course the story of Jonah is for you because it literally begins with Jonah literally doing exactly that. His life takes a turn. God calls him to something he doesn't understand. And he says, hey, I thought I was all in on this thing. Maybe I was wrong about this. So obviously this story has a lot for you, but maybe, you know, I realize there's a lot of people listening to this who, you know, you're a very moral person. Uh, you, you, maybe you've been in the faith for years and, and you sort of know all the right answers about God. I'm just willing to bet, and actually in just a few minutes here, that you're going to see a lot of yourself and Jonah as well, because maybe if you're honest, you would, you would admit that God is, is at bottom, God's really more of a concept to you than a person, And maybe uh, what happens to Jonah in this story has already happened to you. Maybe it's what God desires to do in you and is already beginning to happen in you right now because Jonah, you're going to find out, had known about God for years. I mean, Jonah was a guy that you would look at and say, okay, that's, you know, that's the picture of spiritual strength. That's what I want my kids to be like. That's what I want myself to be like. He knew all about God, but when it mattered in his life, his intellectual grasp of God didn't help him at all because he'd never experienced the reality of God in an existential way to the point that it actually changed him. And so what you're gonna see is that his life actually you know, blew apart. And that's where I think a lot of us live, even if we're not aware of it. Actually, I think it's appropriate to say that we kind of tend to vacillate between those two poles in life, where sometimes we overtly run from God and decide I'm gonna do things my way, or the other end of that is we're not necessarily running from him, we're just struggling to experience his reality in a way that actually changes us and actually heals us, and actually develops and transforms us. And so wherever you're coming from, uh, this book is going to have a lot for you. We're going to start today in chapter 1. I'll read verses uh, 1 through 10, and then, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Um, but here's what it says. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because their wickedness has confronted me. However, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Then the Lord hurled a violent wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. The sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. The captain approached him and said, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. 
Come on, the sailors said to each other, let's cast lots, then we'll know who is to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lots, and the lot singled out Jonah. And they said to him, tell us who's to blame for this trouble we're in. What's your business, and where are you from? What's your country? What people are you from? He answered them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship Yahweh, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this you've done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he told them. This is God's word. Uh, I mentioned on the front end here that the, the book of Jonah uh, is relevant in the sense that it deals with, with topics that we're all, um, all dealing with. Uh, and right here on the first 10 verses of Jonah, it deals with a, something that, that you know, we, we all have to face eventually in our own lives, but it's something that our culture is getting increasingly less comfortable talking about. And it's this thing, I'm sure you've heard something about, that brings something to mind for you. It's this thing called sin. One of the things that's interesting about the book of Jonah is it never uses the word sin. Yet despite the fact that it never actually uses that word, Jonah, as a story, will give you a far deeper fuller, richer understanding of sin than probably what what first comes to your mind. It it actually gives a a far more full-orbed understanding of sin than the traditional view of sin. And if in hearing that, the first thing that comes to your mind is, you know, well, I guess I can sort of tune out today because I know all about sin, I just want to offer you this. So did Jonah. Uh, Jonah knew more about sin than you and I ever will in our lifetime. He was a prophet of God. But what his life is going to quickly show us is there's a world of difference between knowing about sin and really understanding sin and really understanding uh, your own heart and being able to identify sin lurking beneath the surface of your own heart like a ticking time bomb. Um, and, And so in these verses right here, what we're seeing is kind of first thing Jonah shows us is that there was a kind of sin in Jonah's life that flew under his radar that he was largely unaware of until it was almost too late and blew his entire life apart, which is something that I think we all want to avoid. But that's where I think a lot of us live, where we know all about sin. But there's, there's a world of difference between knowing about sin and really understanding it and being able to identify it lurking beneath the surface in our own hearts. And that is really the stated goal of this teaching. Uh, My desire with this and the the goal of this is that every one of us would be able to really understand sin, to really understand our hearts, to really understand ourselves, and be able to identify what's going on in our own life before it causes us a whole lot of pain. And so to do that, we're going to look at at four kind of features in these first 10 verses uh, and how each one shows us something about sin. And I'll tell you what they are on the front end. We're going to look at at the coming word, the running man, the deep sleep, and the stormy hope. And what those four kind of pictures are going to show us is, first off, what sin really is, what its, what its essence is. Secondly, what it entails. Thirdly, what it always eventually leads to. And, and fourthly, what our hope is in the face of all of that. And so with that, I want to get to uh, the, uh, the first theme today, uh, which is going to be our first idea. Number one is uh, it's the coming word. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says this, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their wickedness has confronted me. And so the very, very first words in this book are the word of the Lord came. Now, whenever you see that phrase in the Bible, that's, a, that's actually a Hebrew phrase and it describes the calling of a prophet. Prophets, as you're probably familiar, uh, they really had one purpose in life. They were to communicate God's will on God's behalf. Um, when the word of the Lord came uh, and Jonah decided to run, it's important to understand, if, you, if you're really going to get anything about this book, it's important to understand that that is not just an isolated act of disobedience. It's actually a lot more serious than that. And, and the, probably the, the, the illustration that makes the most sense to me, a lot of you knew that I was a firefighter before I became a pastor. If, if I was still a firefighter, and I got a call for a house fire with people trapped. And in response to that call, I said, I'm not really feeling that today. You know, hard pass on that one. You know, not exactly in the mood for, I got, you know, kind of processing a lot right now. Not, I'm just not going to do that. That isn't the kind of thing that's just going to show up on my yearly assessment. 
when my lieutenant kind of looks over my performance review for the, like, that's not going to fall under the, you know, potential areas of growth kind of thing. Because what that is, is a flagrant refusal to do the one thing that's really central to being a firefighter. And so with that idea in mind, for the word of the Lord to come to a prophet and that prophet to turn and run from it, that's no different. Like that is, it's, it's, it's Jonah explicitly saying, he's making a decision in his life to say, okay, from here on out, I'm no longer going to find my purpose in God's calling on my life and my identity from God. This is, this is Jonah saying right at, the, right at the gate here, he's saying from here on out, I'm going to decide for myself who I am and how I'm going to live. That's what Jonah's doing by running away from the word of the Lord as a prophet of the Lord. When you understand what he's doing that way, you realize that this isn't just something that applies to prophets because this isn't just something that prophets do. All right, if, if you go back to the very beginning of Scripture in, in, uh, in Genesis, you'll see significantly enough that when God created everything, the way that God chose to create things was not by thinking them into existence or, or, or kind of like you know, the opposite of Thanos, snapping things into existence. God chose to speak things into existence. In other words, you could say at the very beginning of, of creation, what happened was the word of the Lord came from the mouth of the creator and everything that exists, exists because God called it into being. You and I exist because God called us into being. And that has all kinds of interesting implications. What that means, first and foremost, is that nothing exists pointlessly. That there is nothing that God has called into being without assigning a purpose to that being. But, but what that also means, and this is really important for what we're talking about today, it means that you and I will not be able to discover the point of our lives we're not going to be able to discover our true selves. We're not going to find our identity unless or until we find it at the feet of God. That's what that means. And what you're seeing right at the, or at, at, at the gate here in Jonah's life is Jonah's gone the other way. Jonah has decided to try to build an identity for himself apart from God. Uh, and, and so what he's done here is it's much more than God said this and he didn't do it. It's much more than just a simple surface level, he broke the rules, um, it's, it's about trying to forge an identity for yourself apart from God. And that, according to the story of Jonah, is the very essence of sin. Uh, before my fourth child was born, uh, my daughter, Baby B, was born in, in September. Um, before she was born, I, I, started, I was getting into running. And anybody who, who you know, has put in some road work, uh, done, done some cardio, knows it's imperative. You've got to find a good playlist because running is... Uh, the cruelest form of torture that there is. You've got to at least find something good to listen to while you're running. So I, I happened to cross a song one time. I've been waiting for actually a couple years now to use this in a sermon. Um, and so here we are. But I found this song. It's not a Christian song. It's not written from a biblical worldview. And that, that's actually what, what, what caused it uh, just to pop up on my radar. It's called Netflix Trip. And it's actually a song written about the show The Office, which was just removed from Netflix, which I'm sure was devastating for some of us. But in the chorus of that song, it, he says two things. He, first, he says, who are we to wonder where we're going, which is interesting. But right after that, he says what I wanted to focus on. He says, and who am I to tell me who I am? Uh, biblically speaking, and it, 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 I hope you don't get offended at me for saying this because it's not my idea, it's God's. But biblically speaking, you are not qualified to tell you who you are, which is actually a blessing. Because the moment that we try to do that, what happens is we wind up being on trial every single day of our lives. It's like living on a, on a treadmill. Anybody who's done that for any length of time knows that is misery. That's torture because there's no end to it. It's just a constant, you know, we're not qualified to name ourselves. We're not qualified to run our own lives. We're not qualified to be our own creators. But you go back to the very beginning of Scripture and you see what Adam and Eve are doing. It's not just they really wanted fruit that day and God said that's off the menu. Right? The, the original sin when mankind broke from God is we decided we're going to determine who we are apart from you, God. And we're going to determine what happiness looks like, what flourishing looks like. We know better than you. We know that you're trying to hold out on us. So we're going to do this, and we're going to do this without you. It's the creature trying to be the creator. That's the essence of sin. It's about trying to determine who you are apart from the one who has named you. And maybe you're asking the, the, the question, but that's, that's, that's the story of Jonah in a nutshell. And maybe you're asking the question, well, what's the problem with that? And basically, Jonah is a four-chapter answer to that question. 
So that's where we're going to go next, all right? If, if, the, if the essence of sin is trying to build an identity for yourself apart from God, next what I want to really look at is, is, is what does this actually entail and involve and kind of consist of? So with that, we're going to get to our second idea today. Number two, it's the running man. And you see this image in, in, in verse three. It says, however, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence and he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the ferry. He went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Now, before we continue with this story, there's, there's one thing that, that is, is worth highlighting, uh, and that's paying real careful attention to who the bad guy in this story is. And this is where the, the real irony of Jonah comes into play. Because the bad guy in this story, you know, the, the sinner, the fool, the idiot, is not the rebellious, wicked city of Nineveh who's getting ready to get destroyed. And it's not the ignorant, polytheistic sailors on the boat. And it's not a big fish, and it's not even a worm that destroys a plant in chapter 4. It's Jonah, the prophet of God, the most religious person in the entire story. And if, if, if that's meant to show us anything, if the first thing that we're taught here is that sin is not just breaking the rules, it's an attempt to build your identity apart from God, then the second thing this story hits us with immediately is that it's entirely possible for you and I to do that underneath all kinds of religiosity and morality, right? If you're a person who hates the idea of just, you know, fake, religious, pharisaical morality, I will tell you, you and God at least have that much in common, because Jonah is about how sort of offensive that idea is to God. Um, and it's shown us that you can know all the right answers, like Jonah. You can be incredibly moral, like Jonah. You can even be seen as a religious leader in a spiritual community, like Jonah. And under why, all the while underneath all that, you can be building an identity that, that is eventually going to blow up in your face. So, so the question is, what does that actually entail? And really what we're asking is, what does it mean to run from God? Um, you notice in, in my version, twice in chapter three, or uh, in verse three rather, on the front of, of verse three and at the end of verse three, it uses this phrase. It says that Jonah is fleeing from the Lord's presence. Um, strictly speaking, that's not the most helpful translation because strictly speaking, it's impossible to flee the presence of an omnipresent being. You'll find that uh, you don't have the cardio to get that mission accomplished. And actually, Jonah knew that. It's really clear. The way he describes God to the sailors, he says, hey, I know what this is about. I serve a God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. So Jonah knew that he's not going to get away from God like God can't see him anymore. That's why in the Hebrew, um, if you look at this phrase, the Lord's presence, it, what it's actually saying is that Jonah was fleeing from the face of the Lord. Now, that is relational language. And so what this means is that Jonah, what he's doing here is he's not running from, from the, um, he's not spatially running from God, he's relationally running from God. That's what this is about. And so he's, he's not only running away from the center of God's will, what he's actually doing is he's running God out of the center of his life. And so to recap, Jonah has done something here that if, 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 if you know anything about yourself and I know anything about myself, uh, what we got to realize is Jonah's done something here that every single human being has been doing since Genesis chapter 3, which he's looking for. He's, he's, he's decided to build his own identity for himself apart from God. Here's the problem with that, among other things. Here's the problem with that. If you don't find your identity in God, you are going to look for it in something other than God. And I've heard it said, and I, th this, this spoke to me. I didn't come up with this, but this spoke to me, so I just want to share it with you. Some of the most profound kind of self-knowledge that you can have is the knowledge of your own particular strategies for running from God. Meaning some of the most profound kind of self-knowledge that you can have of yourself is the, the things that you look to outside of God to give you your identity. I, I, don't, I don't think it's an overstatement to say you can't begin to spiritually grow. I don't think you can begin to emotionally grow. I don't think there's, there's really a whole lot of growth in your life that can take place at all until you begin to understand yourself on that level. Because whatever that thing is, that's the real center of your life. Whatever you're looking for to give you your identity, that's the real center of your life. And the tricky thing about this is it can be a good thing. It's just a good thing that you turn into a God thing. So for instance, you can look to, there's nothing wrong with being dedicated and devoted to your career. Scripture has a lot to say about you know, getting great at what you're called to do. You know, do all things heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. But it, there's a difference between investing in your career and getting great at your career and looking for your identity in your career. That's a disaster waiting to happen. 
You can do that with your career. You can do that with, with the love of your own children, with the approval of your parents. You can do that with, you know, a romantic partner's attention and affection. It's anything, anything that you look to and tell yourself, when I have that, then I'll have worth. Then my life will have meaning. Then I'll be valuable as, a, then, I'll, then I'll know who I am. Whatever that thing is, that's what you're looking to for your identity. And really that's the center of your life. And actually, whatever that thing is in a very real sense, it's your master. And you'll find that if anything other than God occupies that space in your life, it's not going to be a kind master to you. Uh, it, but what's so striking about this, this, this picture here in verse 3 of the running man, is that um, what Jonah's showing us is that you can be doing that. You can be living this kind of life. You can be looking for an identity outside of God. You can be doing that underneath all of your morality, all of your church going, all of your Bible reading, all of your prayer, all of your do-gooding. Underneath all of that, you can build an identity that is a ticking time bomb because it's not resting on God. All right, so, so if the first thing that we see here, if the coming word is, is showing us that, that, that sin's essence is trying to build an identity for yourself apart from God, uh, and, and second, the running man shows us that, that you can be doing this underneath all of your morality and what you're really doing is looking for something or someone else to be and do what only God can be and do for you, then, then the question that this raises uh, and I'm actually most excited to talk about this part because in some ways I think it might be the most important thing that, that we talk about. The, the question this raises is, all right, what does all of this lead to? Okay, so, so looking to your identity outside of God and okay, I'm looking for something or someone. What, is, what, what does all that lead to? Basically, uh, I'm asking the question, what is that, why, why, why should you care, I guess is what I'm asking. And the answer to that question is found in the third theme I want to look at today in Jonah's story. It's number three. This third image is the deep sleep. Now, let me, let me read verses three and five to you, kind of put together. It says, however, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence, went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Then verse five, the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load, and it's this that I wanted to focus on. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. Now, the reason I wanted to put these two verses together is because if you're not really careful, you're going to miss something. Uh, that you're going to miss a picture that this story is painting about Jonah, and what it actually is is it's a warning for you and I. Uh, it says in verse 3 that Jonah, the very first thing he did is he got up to flee. I'm going to return to that in just a second. But after, right after it says he got up to flee three times, it says Jonah went down to Joppa to find a ship. Then he goes down to Tarshish. Then in verse 5, he goes down to the lowest part of the vessel. What the Hebrew, that's what the Old Testament's written in, what the Hebrew is getting across here is this idea is the moment that Jonah decided to walk away from God, that very moment his life became a slow and steady descent. Um, I heard somebody say one time that, that the New Testament is written almost predominantly, actually very predominantly in Greek, in the Old Testament in, in Hebrew. Somebody said, uh, said to me that, the, that you can boil the Greek down to a science, but you boil the Hebrew down to a mystery. And, and the reason for that is because the Hebrew language, is, it's, it's kind of difficult for a, a more Western, more um, linear, pragmatic mind to grasp because the Hebrew language is extremely poetic. It's very uh, image laden. Um, I, I say that to say uh, there's a word used in verse 3 where it says that Jonah got up. The Hebrew word used there is the word kum. And I, I was... Uh, I looked it up this week. It's actually a word that has more than a dozen different possible definitions. And I don't know if this is all, you know, just nerd nonsense to you, but this is the kind of stuff that fascinates me. So I looked up the different definitions that this word can have and the different ways that it was used in Scripture. And uh, this was really profound to me, that this word describing Jonah getting up to flee from God's presence, the Hebrew word kum, this can literally mean to become powerful, it can mean to be valid, to be proven, or even to be fulfilled. And I thought how significant it is that that's, what's, that's what is used to describe Jonah the moment he decided to run out on God. And, and I don't think it's pressing this narrative too much to say that what the Hebrew is getting across here, this is, 
this is so important, I think, for, for myself to understand. Maybe you can agree with this. What this is getting across here is that it really shouldn't surprise you if it feels good for you, at least initially, to decide to be your own God. Let me let that kind of marinate for a second here. This is why it is so devastatingly stupid to follow your heart. This Hebrew word is saying it really shouldn't surprise you if when you do decide to be your own God, to live your own life, to throw off the quote unquote yoke of God, you know, and his ideas and his authority, it shouldn't surprise you if on the front end of that, it does feel empowering. And it does feel, yeah, this is a valid way of life and I'm proving that this is right and maybe even seems fulfilling. I remember I had a conversation with somebody years ago that really stuck with me. Uh, we, we were kind of meeting in a one-on-one -on -one setting and, and, and they had decided to do something that, that is, it's, it's, there's no gray area, it's just crystal clear. God says, don't do that. And they knew where I stood with that and you know, I, I, of course I love them regardless of, of, of all that kind of stuff, but we were kind of talking through that decision and, and you know, just how they arrived at that conclusion. And they said to me, they said, yeah, so what I, what I did is I stopped listening to other people and I stopped reading the Bible. I think that's two red flags there, but okay. So I stopped listening to everybody else and I stopped reading the Bible, and they said, and I just started praying. And I, you know, I, I just said, all right, God, if you, you know, reveal it to me that this isn't the right thing to do, then I won't do it. But then they told me, the, the way that they were, they were communicating this, they were basically saying, hey, this feels right what I'm deciding to do. This feels good what I'm deciding to do. And, and what, what this word is getting across is, of course it does. People wouldn't sin if it didn't feel good. At least initially, I'm sure the fruit tasted good in the Garden of Eden. I think at least there's a, there's a part of every sin I've ever decided to commit that for at least a moment had some kind of surface level satisfaction. But what this is getting across is that even if you don't realize it, what happens the moment that you and I decide to do that is we begin a slow and steady descent. And at the bottom of that is, is waiting for us what was waiting for Jonah. It's this Jonah falls into a deep sleep. Now, I know I'm getting technical today. There's a lot of Hebrew here. But again, this Hebrew word that describes this deep sleep, it's kind of hard to translate. But interestingly enough, to me at least, it's, it's a word that comes from the same exact word used to describe what God did to Adam when he put him asleep to take a rib from him. I said, wow, when I thought that too. So at least one person in the congregation thinks this is as neat as I do. Praise God, you know, like-minded kind of thing. So, so what we're talking about here, this is not the image of, you know, Jonah has been running for so long he's tired. This is something far deeper than that. What, what this is talking about is anesthesia. Jonah's out, Jonah's under. Now, that to me was really significant because it got me thinking about, about um, anesthesia. And anesthesia, uh, anesthesia is obviously a great thing to have in the event that you need surgery. Right? Anybody who's had, I had to get you know, my wisdom teeth and I had to get my tonsils out and praise God that he saw fit to make me born in a time when, when anesthesia was a thing. But really outside the scope of, of, of surgery, anesthesia is a very bad thing. Um, I mean, anesthesia is not natural at all because what it actually does is it dulls a very necessary part of you, the part of you that recognizes when you are in danger and something destructive is happening to your person so that you can respond to that and get away from that. So, so outside the very narrow scope of you getting surgery, anesthesia is a very deadly thing. And that's exactly what's happened to Jonah here. What's happened is a, is, a, is a very necessary, very human part of Jonah has been turned off to the point that he's numb and he is inappropriately unaware of what's happening around him and what's happening to him and how much danger he's actually in. He's unaware of what's going on in his own life. And, and just these few verses here, what, what's happened evidently is he has now gone and done something that he swore he'd never do. I mean, a week ago, this guy looked like a leader in the religious community. Now he's on the run. He's, he's flagrantly throwing off what God has called him to do with his life. So he's done something that he swore he'd never do, and he's become something that he swore he'd never be. Like, I don't know, a prodigal prophet. And this isn't just a picture of what happened in Jonah's life. This is a picture of what will inevitably happen in all of our lives when we decide to do what Jonah's done. So I think it would be helpful. Let's just kind of get to the inner workings of what, what was going on in, in, in Jonah's heart here. Uh, why was Jonah like this? Uh, if you only read the first 10 verses of Jonah, which is all we're looking at today, if you only had the first 10 verses, you would think the reason Jonah took off running is because he was scared. Because Nineveh is this powerful city and he's worried he's gonna go there, he's gonna preach and they're gonna kill him. 
But if you stay with me through the next seven weeks, you'll find in Jonah 4, Jonah tells on himself. He's explicit with why he ran away from God's call to go preach to that city. And, and at bottom, it wasn't because he was, he was afraid that they would reject his message and he'd be killed. He was actually afraid that they would accept his message and Nineveh would be spared, which is pretty ugly. All right, so, so evidently what had happened in Jonah's life, you got to remember, Jonah was an Israelite. So Jonah was, Jonah was on the inside. He was born into the people of God. And evidently, evidently Jonah had made that which is a naturally good thing and it's something to be thankful for, but what Jonah had done is he'd made that instead of the love of God and the grace of God the core of his identity to the point that he looked down on other people and he didn't want anybody else to receive the grace of God like he had. He wanted them to receive the judgment of God. <clears throat> and so here's a picture of a man <clears throat> who's looking to, to other, other nations. <clears throat> I'm not getting emotional. Just give me a second here. <clears throat> oh, Man, it's a bad time for this to happen. One second. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so he's looking down on other nations and races and cultures, and he's seeing them just as outsiders. <clears throat> oh, man. We're going to get through this church. <clears throat> and so there's layers to what was going on in his heart. I mean, you have, on one hand, pharisaical religiosity, where Jonah's looking at other people and seeing them as morally inferior and undeserving of God's love. That's ugly. You know, the, the other layer to this is racial prejudice. He's looking at the Assyrians <clears throat> as, uh, you know, fundamentally inferior to who he is. Uh, and praise God. Praise God for you, brother. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, here we go. And then finally, uh, you, you can see toxic nationalism here, where Jonah saw, you know, him and his people and his tribe and people who look like him and thought like him and live like him as, you know, fundamentally, you know, superior to everybody else. All of that stemmed from his decision to make something else other than God, you know, the source of his identity. And, and when you zoom out from this, it's stunning to me, and I think it should be stunning to all of us, how bad this book makes Jonah look. I mean, to me, he is so much worse than, than a villain in a comic book story. Because here Jonah had received the grace of God. I mean, it's not like he worked his way into the people of God. It's not like he studied really hard to be a prophet of God. Everything about Jonah's life was a gift freely given by grace to him. And here he is going to the greatest lengths possible to deny other people the grace that he'd been shown. And it's caused him to descend deeper and deeper into this deep sleep, an absolute shell of the man of God he once thought he was. All because he decided to find his identity in something other than God. And so here's the, the question, and this is where this really gets sobering. The question that this, this has, the, this should cause the reader to ask, and nobody can answer this for you, nobody can answer this for me, but the question is, do you really know your own heart? <clears throat> because so many people, so many people do religious things, and they live these, you know, moral lives, and they say, well, I'm a good person, and they think, you know, I'm right with God, because look at all the good that I've done, and maybe that'll tip the scale, and, 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 and think that they're living for Jesus. But the truth is, is the, this, is, this is one of the major themes of Jonah. The truth is there is a competitor in every one of our lives for the centrality of our hearts. And if you don't know what that thing is, in you, and the truth is it's usually more than one thing, but if you don't know what that thing is in your own heart, then you don't really know yourself. You don't. You have a surface level understanding of yourself because you have a surface level understanding of sin. And what just these first few verses in Jonah are meant to show us is that it's entirely possible to live an incredibly sinful life while keeping all the rules. <clears throat> That's what Saul, the Pharisee, was doing before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and that's who Jonah was prior to this moment in his life. I mean, all his life, he'd been an ideal citizen. He'd been, a, he'd been the kind of guy, man, if my kids could just, you know, grow up and walk the straight and narrow just like that. But a lot of people, a lot of people live the life that, I mean, maybe you heard some stories about it in, in, in 2020, but there were a lot of people that were leaders in the church, I don't have to say any names, but leaders in the church that, you know, hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of people look to, I'm sure you've heard stories about this before, and they look like these paragons of morality, and they got everything right, and look at their heart, and all this kind of stuff, and then you find out they were embezzling money, or they had this affair, and it blew up their family, and it blew up their life, and the people around them don't understand it, and sometimes they themselves don't understand it, but what happened is underneath all of that morality, 
underneath all of that surface level do-goodism, they were building their identity on something other than God. And when something threatens that, when something challenges that, when something gets between us and whatever that thing is, it will lead us to do things we never thought we would do and become a person we never thought we'd be. That's how serious this is. That's the story of Jonah. All right, so, so what's clear here is that what Jonah needs is far more than just, you know, some, some new habits to incorporate, you know, new year, new you kind of thing. He needs, a, he needs a transformation of his identity at the core of who he is, and there's only one force in the universe powerful enough to accomplish that kind of change in a human heart, and that's an encounter with the grace of God, period. There's nothing that will change a human heart more holistically than an encounter with the grace of God. What Jonah needs is what everybody needs. Every single one of us needs. He needs to get to the point where he is building his life on the love of God and the grace of God. And how God gets Jonah to that point is really what the whole story of Jonah, the whole book of Jonah is all about. But we can see the beginning uh, of how God starts to do that in Jonah's life. And actually, I think it's how he starts to do it in all of our lives. What God does uh, for, all, for all of us is the same thing he does for Jonah in this story. He sends a storm. And this, this is going to bring us to our last idea today, and, and uh, you know, maybe this is where some of this is really going to speak to some of you. The fourth and last idea we're going to look at today is the stormy hope. Jonah chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Then the Lord hurled a violent wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. <clears throat> I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that nobody changes apart from a storm. I know I wouldn't. There is no greater teacher in my life than pain. And I have yet to meet somebody that said, my life was perfect. And then I realized how much I needed to change, so I gave it to Jesus. <laughs> I haven't met that person yet. I wouldn't particularly want to meet that person. It certainly has been my story, and I don't think it's been yours. And what's interesting is that every time God sends a storm in our life, uh, the default function of the human heart, that's a phrase you hear, you hear me say all the time, but the default function of the human heart in the face of a storm that God sends, for the first thing I tend to ask, we tend to ask, God, why would you do this? Why would you let me through? Why would you lead me through this? Knowing what you know, being as powerful as you are, why the storm? And the interesting thing in the story of Jonah is we can see as clear as day what the purpose of the storm was in Jonah's life because it's always easy to identify the purpose of a storm in somebody else's life. <clears throat> but what's crystal clear in Jonah's life the reason for the storm was because God wanted Jonah. He wasn't done with him. He loved him. I was just thinking about it this week. You know how much easier it would be for God to have just personally delivered his message to Nineveh himself? There would be 0% chance that gets messed up, and it would cause a lot less work on God's part. Or even if he decided to use a prophet, okay, Jonah has now decided to set sail across the Mediterranean. God could have just let that dummy ruin his life and decided to raise up another prophet who wants to have a wildly effective ministry and turn a city around for his, like that would have been a really amazing story. I would love it if God called me to say, stand in the middle of Baltimore and I'm gonna bring revival through. It's an incredible life God called Jonah to. God could have, he could have found a long list of prophets who wanted to be used like this. But the storm that he sent after Jonah was because he loved Jonah and he refused to let him go. And that's what grace, that's all grace is. It is God's effort to pursue and intercept us in the middle of our stupid, stubborn, self-destructive lives. And as painful and as horrifying as those storms are, one thing I think we know, only a God who loves you will send a storm in your life if that's what it takes to bring you back. We would, none of us would come home if it wasn't for a storm. None of us would change if it wasn't for a storm. And what, the way that Jonah responds to his storm is really a model of, of, of the way that we're called to respond in ours. And this is a little bit theoretical. It's going to look different in all of our lives. But what we see is that in Jonah's storm, for the first time in his life, he starts to obey God. And he does so without knowing how it's going to go for him. <clears throat> we read these verses on the front end. But these sailors, you know, having lived all their lives on the sea, they quickly realized this storm had a divine origin. This wasn't anything like they'd seen before. They knew God was trying to get their attention. So they start asking questions. And Jonah confesses. He says, hey, listen, I know the God who's the author of this storm. And even further than that, Jonah says, and it's not right that you all should have to pay for my disobedience, so the smartest thing that you could do is, is throw me overboard. And so that's what they do. 
And, and I mean, people have different ideas about what Jonah's, Jonah's motives really were for being thrown in the sea. You know, were those pure motives? Were those impure motives? Either way, what is clear, the plain fact here, is that that represented the first time in this story that Jonah thinks about anybody other than himself, and it represents the first time that he made a deliberate decision to stop running from God. And the irony of this story is that had Jonah continued to run from the storm, it would have killed him. But in deciding to face that storm, he was saved. And I think, that's how, I think that's how the storms that God sends in all of our lives work. That when God sends a storm, every instinct of your and my heart says, run from this. Because who likes pain? You know, nothing in the natural human heart says, well, let me lean into this storm. Let me ask myself, what, what's the cause of this? And what's God trying to do in me and through me? And let me sit through this surgery as painful as it is. Everything in us wants to run from it. But if we choose to run from it, we do so to our own peril. And our lives will continue to break apart just the way Jonah's boat was continuing to break apart. But if we face these storms, even if our heart tells us that this is crazy, this is suicide to do so, that's where hope is found. That's what Jonah's life shows us. Because the moment that Jonah decided to do this, a process has begun in his life. And it's not an overnight thing. And it's not a, a, a quick, clear, one and done thing, but the moment that Jonah decides to face this storm, this process has begun in his life that leads to his eventual, ongoing, progressive transformation. And he discovers that underneath this storm, and underneath that wind, and underneath those waves, and underneath that wrath was the love of God. And, and then for the first time in his life, for the very first time in his life, this preacher who was called to communicate grace experiences it personally. And now it's no longer a theory or a concept. It's something that Jonah learns to build his life on. Now, I, I said a few minutes ago that, that Jonah looks about as ugly as a person can in this story. And it's great that God forgives him, and he gives him a second chance, uh, and, and he, you know, he's got a future for him. But the question that raises is, if God's a holy God, then why is, he able, why is God able to do this for Jonah? Why is he able to forgive him? And the answer is, because years after the life and death of Jonah, Jesus Christ was here, and he said to a group of people, this is incredibly significant, Jesus said, the only sign I will give you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And, and at the end of that discourse, he said, referring to himself, he said that one greater than Jonah has arrived. Now, see, I, I, I can end this teaching today just by saying, all right, so go you know, face your storms, church. You know, choose to trust or whatever other bumper sticker statement we could conclude a ser you know, sermon with today. The, the truth is that's a really easy thing to talk about on Sunday morning. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do in real life. You know, when God sends a storm in our life to choose to lean into that, to choose to surrender to God, to surrender to whatever he wants to do in us, that might be, which is that's all repentance is, by the way. It's just me turning from the life I was living and saying, God, whatever this costs me, however painful it is, whatever you want to do in me, have your way. That's repentance. That might be the most counterintuitive thing a human heart is ever called to do, but as difficult as that is, it's actually a lot easier for you and I to do that than it was for Jonah because we have such a better understanding of the heart of God than he ever did because we know, we can look at the worst thing, you and I can look at the worst things that, that, that happen in our lives, the most terrifying, violent storms that happen in our lives. And we can know that underneath that wind and underneath those waves, that God loves us, that God is for us, and his heart is not to destroy us, but to, to, to deliver us and to develop us. Because we, knew, we know the one who was greater than Jonah. We knew the one who was thrown into the real storm of God's wrath so that we could be saved. We knew the one who faced that storm without anybody to save him, and, he, and that he did that for us. And it's only when you and I know that he's done that for us, that and only that will transform our identity. I, I want to call the worship team up, um, and, <clears throat> and we'll start winding down. I, I, recently, somebody, this, this made a lot of sense to me, that it takes a lot of courage to believe how loved you are in Jesus. That believing and accepting how loved you are by Jesus actually requires a certain amount of courage because if you believe, if you accept that you were loved by Jesus to the point that he was willing to give his life for you, that he was willing to die for you, that means that the only proper response then is to now give your life to him. It means, it means a complete loss of surrender of your own life. That if he paid that price for you out of love for you, then the only response is to now completely, you and I, to let go of the reins of our lives. 
But so often the issue underneath all the issues in our life, this is the case in Jonah, maybe it's the case in your life right now, I can certainly see it in my life. The issue underneath every other issue we have is we just can't accept that. We just can't believe that. That we were so sinful, he had to die for us. But we are so treasured and valued and loved that he was glad to die for us. That's what the gospel shows us. And the key to change is to see that and to know that and to build our lives on that over and over and over again. So I just, I just want to leave you with this. Every single one of us has rejected the coming word. Every single one of us has. And we've tried to build an identity for ourselves apart from God. And in doing that, every single one of us has become the running man where we've looked to someone or something else to be and do for us what only God can be and do for us. And in deciding to live that way, every single one of us knows what the deep sleep is. Every single one of us knows what it is to be this kind of numb, anesthetized version of, of who we once thought we were. Maybe you've done things you swore you'd never do. Maybe you've become a person you didn't think you were capable of being. You barely recognize yourself. The, the, the great part of the story of Jonah is that all of that takes place at the beginning. It's not the end. And so that means it doesn't have to be the end for us. If Jonah's life shows us anything, it's that there's, there's a stormy hope for every single one of us, despite the fact that we've run out on God, because we know the one who was greater than Jonah, who faced the ultimate storm of God's wrath on our behalf. And by knowing him, and by knowing him more, and by handing over more and more of our lives to him, we can face all of the infinitely smaller storms that God sends in our lives and might be choosing to lead some of us through right now. And we can face those storms knowing that we will not drown in those waves because we know one who drowned for us. And he did so willingly. Knowing him and building your life on what he's done for you and I, that's the key to change over and over and over again. That's how Jesus transforms a life. And there's nothing better than that. It's my hope for me this year. It's my hope for all of us this year. That's what we're going to talk about over the next seven weeks. So I hope to see you here. That's it. And that's all. Let me go ahead and pray for us. Father God, I, I just want to thank you that there is a stormy hope for every single one of us. And that in Jesus, we serve a Savior who knows what pain and loss and hardship and tragedy is, not because he paid for his sins, but because he paid for mine and he paid for ours. And we can hold on to him in the middle of the sea and the storm and the wind and the waves. And we know that we're not going to drown. We're going to be saved. It's for our deliverance, not our destruction. By grace through faith in the name of Jesus. Father, would you teach us what it is to see what's really going on in our hearts and to turn it over to you again and again and again so that we can be the people, not just that we want to be, but the people that you've called us to be. That we would find our identity in you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we ask these things. Amen.
never stop, never stop working, never stop, never stop working, even when I don't see it your way. We are so blessed that you chose to spend this time with us this morning, either here in person or online. You know, it's hard to believe that 2021 is finally here. And while I'm sure that you would agree with me that uh, it feels really good to put 2020 and its challenges, its unprecedented challenges in our rear view, let's commit to one another that we're not going to allow 2021 to just be a repeat of 2020. Because you know what? God is still at work building his church. And his word says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And you know the really cool thing? God chooses to build his church through and with people like you and like me, if we choose to allow him to do it. So let's let 2021 be the year where we decided as a church to allow God to use each and every one of us to build it, to build it, Lord, and, and to, to affect lives right here in Severn, Maryland and everywhere that God chooses to allow this work to transform lives through Jesus around the world. See you next week.